I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining today's session, where we'll be getting an introduction on CMDB and configuration functionality within SupportWorks from Samurai Estefanos for our Hornbill Consultancy team lead. Just to inform you, Delegate Audio will be muted during the presentation just to facilitate flow and to timekeeping. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type into the GoToMeeting question facilities on the right-hand side of your screen. We will collect questions and answer them at the end of the presentation. Thank you once again for taking the time to attend. I'll now pass you over to Samurai. Hello, everybody, um, and uh, welcome. Uh, it's uh, it's my pleasure today to conduct uh, for you this introductory look at the SupportWorks CMDB. Um, <clears throat> uh, although this session will concentrate on the CMDB within SupportWorks, I think it's important that we uh, we understand what it is uh, and what it holds before delving into the product. Uh, I also think it's important that we understand the effort required to implement the CMDB and draw not only on this presentation, hopefully, the many video tutorials that Hornbill make available, um, but also draw on the many papers and experiences that will have been published online um, to fully uh, take advantage of the vast information and progress that's being made uh, to the way that we tackle this important but controversial uh, area. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, other presentations that I've uh, that I've conducted in the past, uh, as fortunate or unfortunate that may be, will know that I don't keep it practical or just theoretical. Hopefully, again this time, I will have a a decent mix um, uh, of both. So, a basic agenda: uh, we'll quickly look at what what is a CMDB and what's in it. Uh, how do I get data into it? We'll uh, delve into the configuration types. That's essentially where you need to start when you're considering uh, building your CMDB. Uh, and then we'll touch on and hopefully look at a decent amount of data for operational relationships. Um, and at the end, we'll, we'll do a QA. and a So throughout, throughout sort of uh, looking at the product, I'm also going to be delving into the various perspectives that uh, would allow you to see data within your CMDB. So uh, if you're looking at a call or a person and all that kind of stuff, and, and what, what actual information you are able to look at. Uh, data from the CMDB. So, the the first item then, uh, what is uh, a CMDB? So, a general description that you'll be able to find on the internet might say something like uh, a CMDB is a data warehouse containing configuration items uh, and components for the organization's IT services. In addition, a typical feature might be to store the relationships between those components. Um, and significantly more importantly, act on operational dependencies or indicate the impact of those dependencies in the event of an issue or a proactive uh, impact analysis uh, taking place. Of course, <coughs> this is this is a, um, a sort of my description. Uh, many bodies of work out there will describe the CMDB in different ways. There are many ways of saying the same thing or a similar thing, and you'll find that many descriptions essentially they all describe a very similar CMDB. Um, some of the descriptions you'll, you'll find, or some of the, the, the body of work that you'll find, uh, will, will indicate or, or gives the impression that it should be a singular repository. My personal opinion, uh, and the opinion of many, uh, is that a specific CMDB, such as SupportWorks, is a singular repository, but the organization's CMDB is a collection of repositories, so a, a federated management of your data. Uh, this is uh, referred to as a CMS, a configuration management system. So what my description doesn't say is that it's all the information on all the components. Much like your knowledge base, your information may be spread across many tools, and therefore, in this case, you may choose to store essential information in some and more detailed information in others. As I stated earlier, there are, there are elements uh, um, of this topic that are controversial and subject to many a debate. We won't be delving, hopefully, into, into that unless I suddenly get a, a feeling for it, but hopefully we won't be delving into, into that, uh, and we won't be talking about what to store and where to store, although hopefully I'll be giving you some guidance on, on how to sort of work that out. The, essentially, that's an important design consideration that needs to take place when working with multiple systems, um, because what you're hoping to, uh, what, you're, what, you're not, what you're not wanting is to, is to store the same thing in many places and end up with no one system containing the truth, and therefore avoid uh, an out-of-date, unsynchronized set of systems that bring 
little or no benefit to anyone, let alone the service desk. So, but what, why, why, am I, why am I mentioning that and why have, I, why have I stated that? Well, one of the very basic things that can be done is to only bring into support work CMDB the highest level of detail for a component that is needed in order to, prog to progress with a specific request. Uh, you know, d depending obviously the type of request or what data you're looking at. So you may choose for some items to store more detail than you would do for other items. So you may choose to store less details about a laptop and a desktop but more detail about a specific server because obviously if it's controlled via uh, change control, you may need to have that detail present at, within the request or available from within the same tool in order to make certain decisions. Obviously in that scenario then a good understanding and links between systems needs to exist so that further detail can be gained should it be required by simply following a designed process to access that data. And that, believe it or not, is not simply a support works challenge, which is how most people see it. Uh, and it's by no means a small undertaking. Uh, this is obviously part and parcel of the uh, federated CMS uh, structure that I alluded to earlier on. So how does Hornbill and SupportWorks help you to achieve this? Well, SupportWorks, for instance, has a set of connectors which link directly to uh, something like SCCM, for example, uh, in order to display more detail about a specific item. This is known to us internally as a, an integration connector. Some tools are specifically built to hold information about the lowest level components without holding any detail about any relationships. Other tools discover and keep uh, the components up to date. SupportWorks will feed from many of these tools in order to keep updated and will hold operational and non-operational relationships with organizations, sites, department, owner, and other components within the CMDB, as do other tools, even those in a different space to SupportWorks. That's why the design process is very important, um, as it will include the decisions on how much to store and where to store the data. So that leads me on to uh, um, my next question, uh, what's in it? So we have an idea of what's in it, because uh, the description gives us some detail of what we can expect. Uh, this question is aimed specifically at support works, though, so when we uh, so we now move uh, away from the design considerations and move specifically into what can uh, and is stored in support works. It's, it's very important that you know and understand for operational purposes what can be stored in the support works CMDB and what is visible. Obviously the visibility depends on the perspective. So if I'm looking at a, uh, a user, uh, I, can, uh, I should be able to see their specific items and services. The same for an organization, site, and specific components. So we know about the typical things. Uh, that are stored in the CMDB, like the laptop, desktop, server, mobile, all the various things that you can see on the screen. Something that's, uh, that, in my experience, isn't widely known is that all organizational structural information uh, is also stored in the CMDB. Arguably, your HR data is also a CMDB containing people information, as is your AD data. So um, why would we necessarily need to store that in support works? The organization site departments, people, and SLAs, uh, services in support work CMDB are all CIs, um, but they are not all visible from the CMDB management screen. And the reason to store them is not intended to be the sole truth uh, with regards to that, to that particular data item. As and when you create the data in many parts of support works, the data is also stored as part of, a, of the CMDB. Support works uses this data to forge relationships with other data items within the CMDB. So our first look into the CMDB area within uh, within SupportWorks is is going to uh, look at a pre-populated CMDB to get an understanding of what what's in it. Uh, and in order for me to do this, I'm going to use SupportWorks and a server-based tool uh, to run a quick query. Now you're going to have to excuse me because it means I have to stop the presentation, dip away, go into the tool, and at some point then rerun the presentation again to continue. All right. So our first look is going to be uh, a standard search. What, this is also going to be my opportunity to show show you uh, the different perspectives of where you can see sort of CI information being visible. All right. So the first thing I'm going to uh, tackle is to show you the uh, the CI information within SupportWorks. So I'm currently logged in into SupportWorks here, uh, navigating over to the configuration database area using the left-hand menu items. Uh, I'm just going to type in percent to bring back all the data that I have. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see there we've got items returned uh, and if I scroll down 
um, you'll see that there are Apologies, it, it appears we've lost Samurai. Um, hopefully... Oh, look, that's software documentation. Hello? Hi Samurai, we Hello? can hear you again. We just lost you there for a second. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, alright. I don't know why I didn't do anything other than go over to support works, but maybe it's my uh, connection. Can we continue? All right. Yes, you can. Yep. All right, brilliant. So, <clears throat> um, navigating over to support works. I don't know if you heard that, but I, I quickly just navigated over to the configuration database area, hit percent in the configuration ID, and returned some data. As you can see, there. There are hardware, software, network, uh, various the people, the departments, the sites, all the other data items that I stated were in the CMDB but aren't actually visible in here. So where you would see those, those items of data are within the management screen. And you can see here, if I go to the manage organization, uh, then you'll be able to see that there are items that are being returned. Now, uh, I'm going to run a query to show you that these are in the, in the CMDB, um, but there's no reason really to delve any further than that. So you can see that there is an Aries computer services in here, uh, and within that there are some charge centers, uh, some sites, some departments, and a bunch of customers. Now all of these data items are also stored within the CMDB, uh, and in order to show you that, I'm just going to quickly bring up my query tool, which is, I don't need that one there just for now, let me just get rid of that. Uh, and you can see here what I'm doing, and we'll see why this is the uh, main table within the CMDB, but all I'm essentially doing is bringing back all of the tables in here that have a type of uh, ME, which stands for Managed Entity, okay? And you can see the return, the results that have already been written and uh, contain company sites. So we saw earlier on that we had the Aries Computer Services, we had a London site, uh, a, another site there, and various other customers that belong within uh, that particular organization, but also stored within the CMDB table. Now that's not the only table that contains that data, obviously, because they, they are all, this is only very basic information about that item. As I said, this isn't intended to be the sole truth uh, about that particular item. But if I were to type in a select statement from the user DB, this would be the main table that contains the people information. All it takes elements of that data and back to uh, the main uh, presentation again. Uh, I just want to quickly delve into show you where to find uh, CI information, CMDB details. So uh, in the file menu, you have a manage CMDB and a configuration items. We'll look at the categories and types la uh, later on. But if I select the configuration items. I'm presented with a search screen. Within the search screen, I have various uh, uh, fields available to me in order to be able to filter the data down. But essentially, if I hit the search button, I'm then returning the details um, uh, uh, that, that we saw earlier on. <clears throat> now, part of the federated sort of consideration that I, that I said that organizations really need to sort of consider means that you have to start looking at other tools to get extra details about a particular item. So I'm just going to quickly could bring back a laptop in order to demonstrate what our connectors uh, are capable of doing. And I'm just going to bring back some to my SCCM database. So within within this detail, so for instance, for whatever purposes you're looking at a particular item, you've got some details in here, and you've got even further information in the extended details. But you can see here there's not a lot of information that I've chosen to store about this particular laptop. Uh, in this event, if I know that I have another tool somewhere else, an SCCM, for example, that contains more details, I'm able to use the connector in order to connect to that SCCM uh, database and present further information about this particular item. Now, again, I'm working with uh, test data here, but you can see that this is much more detailed uh, and, con and contains much more information about that particular item that I don't necessarily want to in in import into support works, okay? But on the occasion that I do need to do something, uh, get 
extra information, then I can use the Hib browser. Equally, you can use various other tools. You know, SCCM will have its own browser-based type uh, uh, utility that you'll be able to link into support works if you're not able to use the Hornbill Hib browser. Okay, so that's that's the uh, uh, the CI information. But we'll, later on, we're going to look at the relationships, and this is where essentially they're defined. But just to show you. The, the, if, if you're that's related to uh, the individuals or organizations that you uh, bring into the form, you can see there there's various items in here, including services as well as CIs, uh, choosing to select only items will then show me all of Alan's uh, connected items. Now, <clears throat> I'll quickly touch upon the connection here before I go back to the presentation. The connections can either be ownership or usage, and at the moment we're talking about Alan is either an owner of a particular item or is a uh, a user, um, uh, as in has used it in the past, and and some monitoring tool has discovered and given support works the information about the usage. Okay, um, of the whole load of items down here which don't typically contain uh, wouldn't typically be related to Alan are also listed. These are specifically for my demonstration later on when we're looking at the relationships, um, the operational relationships. Okay, so that's, so that's another perspective that you can look at. But if I go to manage some of this data now, and this, this is the last bit before going back to the presentation, if I manage some of this data, I can also start to see and get appreciation of of the CIs that belong to this organization. So I get a list uh, of CIs specifically that have been uh, identified uh, as items for this particular organization. If I go to a site, I should get a similar view. Uh, and again, you get uh, a list of items here. So actually, the, the previous screen, a list of items uh, like this one. Um, and if I go over to the customer, and I'll quickly go over to Alan C again, I should be able to get, actually has, and here they are. So just to quickly show you what I mean by usage, uh, if I navigate over to that one there, for instance, you can see that there is a contact here, and Alan is the contact. We also have a usage list, so Alan's already listed in there because obviously he owns it but also uses it, but we could equally have several other uh, users of this particular item listed in here and therefore when those details, when their details are being used to log a particular incident or a, or, or, or a problem or whatever, then uh, this particular item would appear on the list of items that can be then selected to be the subject of that. Incident. Navigating back to the presentation then. Am I? <coughs> hi, hi there. Sorry, I just wanted to stop you just to let you know that we do seem to have a bit of interference on the line that sort of breaks up some of your um, speech occasionally. I don't know whether or not um, you need to tweak your phone slightly. Oh, okay, I'll, uh, I'll see if I can adjust my head a little bit. Thank you. So hopefully what, what the, um, what what I've just shown you sort of uh, exposes is uh, the fact that a deeper understanding of the CMDB structure is required. So um, how do we, how do you really uh, get to know the CMDB structure? Well, really, there's only there's only one way, and that is to look at to look and uh, and understand the schema. Uh, many there are many tools and many ways of looking at the schema, but at first, uh, I think the easiest, especially for for those less technical, might be to use the schema report. And you get to the schema report via the support works uh, help client uh, help menu item um, again let me just quickly demonstrate that so the the menu item is uh, the in order to navigate to this uh, particular schema report you um, select the help menu item and then select the support works ITSM schema report uh, this is what that report looks like. Do this if uh, obviously this isn't the the most riveting subject and, and, and it's one that's really difficult to sort of hold audiences to but really it will be worth it if you're interested in the CMDB to really understand the overall support work structure anyway. More importantly there are some decent diagrams here to do with the CMDB so we have some ERDs here for the CMDB a crowfoot and, and just a, a standard uh, column connecting uh, 
um, ERD diagram. So uh, again, this is a very, very complicated area, uh, and essentially these aren't all the tables that are within the CMDB as well, as we'll start to look at in a, in a few minutes. But um, these are definitely, uh, this is definitely an area that you're going to want to look at. Also, out of interest, the various other CMDB tables, if you, if you notice that there is a, CI, a CMDB table in here that you want to delve in and have a look at the structure of, then uh, it will be listed uh, on, on the left-hand side here, and simply selecting that item will start to give you some details of what that table is and give you various descriptions. Things, but um, it will give you some very uh, table, okay? So, in uh, this, as I said before, it's a it's a very complicated area, but it's completely worthwhile. But in the main, um, uh, and certainly in the first instance, you're only going to be concerned with a, a few tables. Um, uh, like any complex area or product or challenge, breaking it down to smaller, simpler bite-sized chunks will, will help you make much more progress than if you were to tackle this uh, a, a huge uh, uh, CMDB as one massive undertaking. So uh, I think first understand that there is a, a CMDB area, uh, essentially a live area. Hopefully this isn't too small for you to see, but uh, what what we have is uh, a main table, and I think earlier on when I ran the query, you, I, I, I stated what the table name was. It was config underscore item I, and we'll see that in a minute anyway. And then we have some extended details, so specifically about a table that holds specifically server-based information and possibly maybe laptop and desktop information, maybe network and printer and so on and so forth. It's essentially it's up to you. You can create these extended tables um, and link them to the main table. Um, but, uh, but we also have various other tables that store maybe blackout information, relationships, availability, and so on and so forth. The secondary area then is a, a, a staging area. And essentially what takes place when we bring data into, into support works for the CMDB is that it first arrives in the staging area and then is uh, uh, sort of uh, promoted to the CMDB live area. Okay, so this is our staging area, and essentially the staging area, uh, not so many tables in this area, they mimic the main tables within the CMDB Live. So if you have a main table in the CMDB Live, there's also a main table in the CMDB Stage. Okay, the, uh, the names of these I'll, I'll show you in a minute. But we also have extended tables, and therefore there are extended versions within the CMDB Staging area. Now the reason why the staging area exists is to allow you to have an area that, that you would then uh, make some decisions on to whether, uh, you know, based around what your processes are, uh, whether that you are going to uh, affect your CMDB live area. So if you're governed completely by change and there happens to be no change but you've noticed that the CMDB staging area contains difference, you can then choose to make a decision as to whether you promote that to live or not. I mean, it's, it's possible to also decline these items rather than promoting them to the CMDB live. So what we have is a, a main table called config, called config item I, and uh, uh, the table that that is related to within the staging area is called CMDB underscore stage. Now the format and naming convention for the others is much simpler. The extended tables, tables within the CMDB live area typically start with, are prefixed with CI type, uh, and then are followed by uh, a, a specific name. So gen HDW is general hardware. So the associated table within the uh, within the staging area has exactly the same name, except it is suffixed by underscore stage. All right. And equally for the network, you have CI type underscore network, and then you have a main table within the staging area called. Uh, well, actually, that's that's not quite right. That's supposed to say CI type underscore network underscore stage, and CI type underscore server underscore stage. My mistake. I'll fix that before the presentation is actually sent out to you guys. Um, so that, that kind of leads us on to, uh, to the next, uh, next question, really, um, and that is, uh, how do we get CI information into the CMDB? So you've got uh, a few options. You can create uh, manually by passing the staging area. It goes directly into the CMDB live. You can, create, uh, you can import from the CSV and use data, uh, our data import tool, to, to migrate the data from the source to the destination. Or you can import directly from the source still using the data import tool, essentially meaning that you go directly to the database using a database connection. 
So the prospect of, uh, of creating these items manually doesn't sit very well with most people. But again, in my opinion, the manual creation of, a, of an item also has a place. If we take a, a scenario of a procurement, uh, that item will eventually be received and tagged before finding its way onto the network and being discovered. So the need, the need to record this item within a request might present itself prior to the item being officially discovered and therefore being brought into SupportWorks. Again, this is a much larger topic than I'm making it sound and, and many other factors will come into play to, to force the decision as to where uh, the recording takes place. Essentially, the options are there um, and in some implementations that I've conducted in the past, the decision has been made to incorporate the creation of the CI uh, during the, the receiving of the procured item and therefore it exists in support works before it's even been discovered by any item. Obviously, there's a whole load of uh, discussions to be had with regards to the naming conventions and how the, the discovered item then needs to essentially have exactly the same ID as the one that's already been created and so on and so forth. As I said, it's not a simple topic to cover. So we have imports that we can run which will read the, the source and present the changes to the configuration manager. Prior to the processing from the CMDB stage area, the CMDB uh, and then promoting to the CMDB live. So I think uh, what might be useful uh, to use if you if you are able to see how the imports work. So let's let's go straight into the data import tools uh, and take a look. So the data import tools are uh, the, the data import tool is uh, on the server, it's a server based tool. Uh, if you navigate to your start and then support work server, you'll see it there and it's called data import manager. And looks like this. <coughs> so the data import tool has uh, several tabs within it. Uh, I'll briefly touch upon these various uh, tabs just to explain the, the what we would be able to use them for. So the first tab essentially just lists out all of the import scripts that have already been created. The second tab in is the SQL import. Essentially, if you can create an ODBC DSM connection to a database, then you can use this area in order to be able to connect to that database and bring the data in. The text file import section is essentially used for bringing data in from a CSV. Um, the LDAP imports is used to connect directly to your, uh, to your AD uh, and therefore bring uh, data in from your AD. The Excel imports is uh, specifically for importing from Excel spreadsheets. The default data would typically be used during the beginning, the, the first parts of, uh, of the project to get support works in to get default data in. Uh, subsequently, if we needed to, we could also then bring back some, some default data should it uh, be required. The other imports tab is uh, specifically for importing um, uh, profile codes uh, using a specific specifically formatted uh, spreadsheet. So just to go back and explain the two different types of imports for CMDB, for CIs, I currently have a, an SCCM uh, import script defined, and I'll just quickly, and this is the one that I used to bring in some of the data into my CMDB that we looked at earlier on. So I have a connection to SCCM already defined that uh, tests and connects. I am using a query. Obviously, the, the SCCM database structure is fairly complicated, and the data is not stored in a single table. In fact, it's stored in several tables. Uh, and what that allows me to then do, once I hit the query button, is that it brings back all the data based around this query. I could then select the items uh, that are listed in order to map these items. So if I have a tick in here, it will then appear in the second tab to allow me to map it to a support works field. If I move over to the target value mappings area, again, I can see a connection to the support works database here, and it lists out the various tables. As I stated, essentially what we want to do in the main is connect directly to the staging area, and that main table within the staging area is called cmdb underscore stage. I have my fields within that table, and all I then need to do is select a field and map it to the one that's coming from SCCM. It's just hitting the insert value and selecting the appropriate field. Okay, um, we have uh, well, again we're going to be talking about types shortly, CI types, um, but we have uh, a section where we've used some JavaScript to determine the type of the item, the type of the CI that's being brought in using the chassis. Uh, type field within SCCM. So various values that are returned 
will indicate that they are either a laptop or a server or anything else. You can see that 8, 9, 10, and 14 are identified as laptops. Essentially, what this allows us to then do is use this data to then insert directly into the extended tables. Now, there's going to be a slight difference with the way that we do uh, direct database-based imports and spreadsheet or CSV-based imports, and you'll see that because with this import, we only need to define one uh, uh, import script. With a CI or a spreadsheet, we already have several uh, spreadsheets uh, defined and scripts defined, so it works slightly differently. Uh, so once we've decided what fields we're going to map, and you can see these are only the fields in the main table, we actually allow uh, some, some coding in the background, the background that allows us to manage the uh, insertion into the extended table. So we can see here if it's a desktop or if it's a server or if it's a laptop, we're storing various pieces of data uh, specifically for that type, uh, storing it in an array. and that if the item already exists, or we if statement or an update statement. That's, that is essentially how the item gets into, uh, into the tool. The very last tab allows us to, uh, the tab that we're looking at, allows us to run the import and also uh, view uh, the log files should there be any, any, any issues. We've also got, uh, across all of the import scripts, the ability to schedule uh, the import. Now there's there's various videos already, there's, there's, I'm, I'm sure there's a Hornbill based videos that take you in more detail around um, you know the use of the uh, of the of the import tool. The purpose, uh, the the main purpose, uh, the main reason why I'm showing you this, is to compare the import script directly into the from a database uh, with the import scripts that we would typically use uh, when we're bringing data in from a CSV. So you can see here again, uh, ignoring all the items that are not related to the CMDB, you can see that there are several CMDB based imports here. So you can see that there's a main table import and that essentially just bring, takes all of the fields within the spreadsheet and there has to be a specifically formatted spreadsheet uh, to be used with this import um, that then maps directly to uh, all the fields within the CMDB. Excuse that error, it's because that spreadsheet doesn't actually exist. Uh, that CSV file, sorry, doesn't exist. Uh, and we map directly to the field. Uh, we have no additional JavaScript to do anything else other than insert directly into that staging area. We then have a separate spreadsheet, uh, or essentially it could be the same spreadsheet with the same fields in it, but we, we manage it with a separate uh, CSV file uh, that, that is responsible then for inserting into the extended table. So you can see there, there's one for the general hardware, one for the network, and one for server. There's a, there's a little bit more work involved here, but uh, it's essentially less technical. There's no coding involved where we already sub we, we can supply the script and we supply the spreadsheets uh, that with the right columns in place. So all that's required is to put them in place and then navigate to it uh, and hopefully just hit the button to bring the data into the staging area. Okay, so just bear with me one second. Uh, that's, that's essentially the, the, the data that comes into, uh, into the staging area. Summer, I just to um, highlight, I think when you open or close a new box within Hornbill, that's when we get the interference and you cut out slightly. So if you can just wait to, um, for the box to open fully Talk. and then start talking, I think that would be perfect. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. I understand. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So... The, uh, the next item that I, that I want to look at before we sort of, we're going to go back into the CMDB area uh, in a few minutes anyway, uh, but I want to touch upon the, uh, the types um, very quickly. Um, and the, 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 so the, the <coughs> so that's obviously the, the topic uh, warrants various discussions on, on I don't want to, I don't want to make it seem like it was a, a very easy topic. Uh, to cover because there's there's several other things that need to be considered uh, with what we just touched upon. Um, obviously, there, there's several other topics that, that need to be discussed, such as roles, responsibilities. A large portion of uh, uh, of which will revolve around the configuration manager um, role and the change management process that governs the change to your um, your infrastructure. But um, 
uh, that's that's not something that we're going to cover here. Um, but but part of that discussion will be um, the, the the types, the, the data that you bring in, and under what type you classify that particular item. So one of the bits of uh, the data that you will you will have noticed is uh, the CI type when we were looking at it. It was structured such that it had a main type of hardware, uh, a sub uh, subcategory uh, of laptop, and a final uh, type of uh, Dell Latitude, I believe D3, D531, um, uh, and and part of the part of the reason uh, that we create uh, the structure is is because it helps us to categorize and find the things that we want. So it helps us to classify an item, uh, therefore allowing us to be able to search for a specific type of data rather than you know needing to understand and know. Uh, the, the naming convention that we've put in place in order to be able to find a particular laptop or a desktop or a server or whatever. Um, if we if we can classify them, if we can categorize them, then they become a lot easier to find. Also, they become a lot more manageable. And one of the other reasons why we 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 need to sort of discuss this in in more detail when we're when we're coming up with our uh, design for our CMDB is that the final type that we decide upon. Will largely sort of reflect the the, the way that we uh, um, we allocate out our uh, items. So, for instance, if we if we have a standard laptop type, and so we always adhere to a particular laptop. So, when a new request for a laptop comes in, there isn't any choice. Then there's no real need to specify the actual detail of the laptop. As you can see there, it says Dell Latitude D531. There's no need to actually specify that. You could just probably make the last node in that hierarchy laptop. Um, or maybe we might have two different types of laptops. We might have a small and a large. So the, the, the last node might describe small and large. Or maybe uh, based around the kind of spec, you might decide to uh, to go around, you know, maybe screen sizes or that kind of stuff. Um, if we have multiple types of laptops, if we have various makes, then we might need to specify, as we do there, Dell, possibly HP, and so on and so forth. So it's very important that we we sort of consider that when we're when we're coming up with our uh, categorization um, uh, design. So again, I'm gonna uh, as Anna said, I think I'm going to have to wait when I press the escape button here, so because my voice will, will cut out. Hopefully, uh, the mic is back on again. Uh, I wanted to quickly have a look at the CMDB types. So, the types are are found, or the form that allows us to manage our types, is found in the file uh, manage CMDB categories and configuration types menu item. Uh, as soon as I uh, open up that window, you can see that there is a list of items in here, and, and not typical items that you would see uh, in, in, uh, in a typical sort of uh, IT-based CMDB. You can see there that there's hardware, software, network, which is a typical uh, database. You've also got elevator, you've got documentation, electrical, safety, HVAC. Essentially, you can store any CI, any item can be stored in the CMDB that you care to hold configuration information about. Okay, uh, now I don't have much data around these other items, they're just examples that have been thrown in uh, to demonstrate that. But uh, essentially, you know, you might have a facilities department that also uses support works as well as an IT department, as well as various other departments within the organization. And they may choose to store uh, various configurable items. So if facilities might choose to store rooms in there, for instance, they might choose to store rooms in the CMDB. Uh, because rooms can also can be co configured uh, or hold configuration information, um, uh, information essentially that could be modified and changed. Um, so if I if I go into the hardware, see on this screen that we have an area to define subcategories, but we've also got an area at the bottom right where we specify the, the final node. And I think it's really important that you uh, you know that you can't create a type that has that doesn't have a configuration type as a final node. You won't be able to allocate, although in the back end you might be able to allocate them to those types, you won't be able to find it. Essentially the system will force you to provide a final uh, type when you're performing the search. So for instance in this example we have uh, laptop as a subcategory. In the previous example that I was giving, if we didn't need to delve down to the various details of, of the, the types of laptop, 
laptops that we have within the organization, such as these, we might choose not to have these and not to have a subcategory of laptop, but move that laptop as a, from the subcategory area down into the configuration types area, much like the desktop is in here. So over here, we're not really concerned with uh, um, a final type of a specific desktop. Essentially, we only need to know that it is a desktop. We might have multiple desktops, but multiple types of desktops, but essentially, it's, it, we're not really concerned at this stage in terms of categorization, the different types of desktops that we have. Whereas, it's, well, for, for a laptop, it might be necessary. You might choose to do your investigative work slightly differently depending on whether it's a, uh, a PC based laptop or a Mac based laptop for instance. Uh, so it might be more important to store uh, the, the, you know, more detail against a, a laptop than it would be against a desktop. So just to quickly take you through the various other items and pieces of data that are in here, we have a section that allows us to uh, store some status definitions. Creating a status definition against a top type will allow those status definitions to be inherited by any subtypes, so any subcategories or configuration types. Okay. We also have some relationship types here listed. I don't have any listed against these types, uh, but essentially what this allows us to do is connect this item operationally or non-operationally to another item based around these uh, listed relationships. Uh, we have some form field management, so what that basically allows us to do is to control whether the change of a specific field within that, uh, or about that particular item is uh, stored in a history, in a diary. So essentially, if I list them, if, as, as this one currently does, the inventory tool ID gets changed, it will actually uh, store uh, um, uh, the history of it. Um, and obviously, these are the configuration types. So if I go, go into the configuration, uh, configuration type, you can see there that, sorry, it's just gone over to the other screen, you can see there that there are some additional uh, forms. Again, we've got the inherited status definitions here, we've got the relationship types here, we have a VCM, so this is the actual image that would be graphically uh, displayed if you were looking at it in relationship to other CIs using the VCM relationship graphics uh, that, that's available from within SportWorks. Uh, and then the, the same form field management uh, tab there again. So we also have some various, uh, various uh, tick boxes that allow us to either specify whether a additional tab should be visible or not. So ticking this, uh, items of this type can be monitored for availability means that the availability tab will be visible when I'm looking at any CI of this type. We have uh, uh, the ver a list of all the CIs within the CMDB that currently belong to this type listed out here. Um, we also have any, uh, the image and the, so for instance, if you wanted to include this particular type as a component within the service catalog, the defined costs and prices and the image in here would then be used in order to display that item as part of that service catalog. Uh, and the last tab over here, the knowledge base articles will allow you to store specific knowledge base items, articles that are related to this type. So that means any CI that's of this type will also have listed uh, within its knowledge base tab all the items that are listed in here. Okay, that's essentially uh, the type. And again, uh, hopefully I haven't made it sound too simple. Hopefully I've made it sound a lot more uh, uh, warranting uh, more discussions than, than I think most organizations do. It's uh, it, sometimes, in fact, too often what I see is that the, the types that are typically shipped out with, with the installation of the product are kept. Um, uh, and I think you know, it certainly warrants a, a discussion, at least a review of the types that are there to make sure that they are uh, of most benefit to you uh, than just accepting what's already what's already given to you. Okay, so again, I'm just going to uh, pause for a moment while I move back to the presentation. Okay, so <clears throat> that takes us on to, uh, into um, a much more, I think, a much more complicated, and the reason why I, I, I left this there was uh, uh, hopefully so that everybody uh, could be waiting to hear about this particular item. Now, by, by no means don't take this particular representation, this, this diagram, as a realistic representation of what might already exist. I'm just going to briefly talk about what we're seeing on the screen here before I move away into the into SupportWorks to show you what actually is, uh, what SupportWorks is capable of storing and, uh, and enabling in terms of functionality around your operational relationships. 
Okay, so well, again, please don't take this as a as a realistic rep representation. It is something that's just been put together to demonstrate this uh, uh, as an example. So what we have, and we're going to start with the SQL area. We have uh, essentially three instances of SQL related together uh, to to uh, provide some high availability and redundancy, uh, and and there is some sort of operational relationship between that and a reporting server. Uh, equally, that reporting server then has an operational relationship uh, with a marketing application server, which provides services to or, or, or is, has also got an operational dependency uh, or operational relationship with a dashboard service. Okay. Um, now, the, the, these SQL instances might also uh, provide uh, data for more than just you know, the reporting server. You can see here that there's also a connection to the SW replication server. Uh, there is an operational dependency between SupportWorks application server and these databases because we have uh, essentially chosen to do uh, some, you know, store some of the data in, in MS SQL or in, uh, in this database rather than locally storing it. Um, and uh, and we can represent these relationships. Obviously, these aren't. It's not to say that this dashboard service is dependent on support works. It's completely unrelated. It's just to show that actually this in this sort of image of the MS SQL or the SQL or the database instances provides some sort of uh, operational uh, service to many items and you can see there that it provides some sort of service to the reporting server as well as support works and these two may be completely unrelated um, although you know you could you could have a reporting server that also draws on the information from support works so just to quickly show you the the, or the thought process that I went through in order to create these items I could choose to relate the reporting server directly to each one of these MS SQL or SQL or database instances essentially any one of these three things could be providing uh, the, what, what this reporting server needs. It's not up to this reporting server to decide which one it uses. It's part of the way that this has been set up that the data will just be presented. So it doesn't make sense to relate the reporting server directly to these databases. What I need is something logical in the middle that then relates to these three items. I then relate that logical item to whatever other item that I want to. So operationally, this logical uh, CI that sits in between this report uh, reporting server and these database instances is the thing that indicates whether there is some sort of impact to the service based on whether the availability of these three items and essentially that's 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 pretty much what I wanted to show although I'm going to show you that the uh, that there is a uh, a bit of functionality uh, when it comes to um, making this service available uh, and uh, uh, and showing the operational dependency and then acting on that operational dependency should something uh, take place should an issue be experienced. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, dip out again and just quickly uh, pause for a moment and then uh, take you through to the product. <coughs> okay, so hopefully I should be back. Uh, the so if I navigate over to the um, manage CMDB uh, and go over to the configuration items. Uh, I'm going to start with showing you, because uh, obviously this data has to have gotten in, and uh, although I showed you the scripts, I didn't actually show you the uh, staging area in order to be able to take, uh, to, to take, a, um, uh, take full stock of what, what's taking place there. I left it to the end because I needed to show you how the, all of this information would typically come in. Uh, we wouldn't typically hold or import relationships into into the C, into the CMDB that's generally sort of my preference is to generally sort of start very small uh, and build those relationships up as time goes by um, obviously if you have other systems that hold those relationships and you want to bring them in and import those relationships it's it's possible to do that via an import script it's uh, it's just not a, a small uh, task so if, if I hit search on my uh, my search form there you can see that I've got a list of items the items that I have uh, brought in have a specific naming convention only because I wanted to navigate to them easily. Um, so I've called them uh, SEA and then whatever the specific item is. So in uh, let me just quickly go over to the managed area. The managed, the staged area uh, is 
is available via this manage stage items button uh, and once you get there you can just simply hit the uh, search button and it will bring back the details that are now waiting to be processed. When you first import the item the import actions section will be blank uh, and then determine import actions button is then used in order to, for the system to understand the type of action that needs to, to take place. Part of doing that it also builds uh, a small report on each item to, to indicate to you, the, the configuration manager, the details that are expecting to come in. So if I open the first item for instance, you can see that uh, there's, it's, a, it's a create action, and therefore the, sy the system doesn't know anything about this item, and there's not a lot of information that's coming back for this particular item because we're only going to be bringing in some information into the main area. Essentially, I, that's not something that I would choose to bring in. Uh, we have an update action and that tells us that actually we know about the system, we know about this in the system and there are three things that are changing uh, within in this particular record and it presents you the current value as well as what's currently in the staging value. So you can see there that bringing this in is going to change that type from laptop uh, Dell Latitude D531 to hardware laptop. Now it's not a good move because we know that the very uh, our structure of our types currently doesn't accommodate for a final node of laptop. So essentially if I was to bring this item in, I wouldn't be able to search for it. Uh, I wouldn't be able to uh, to do very much, uh, sorry, I'd be able to find it, but I wouldn't be able to do uh, very much else with it in terms of being able to add it as a, as a component to anything because the very last node is, is not the type, it's still a category. Okay, uh, so just to quickly show you some other uh, items that have a little bit more detail. I know one of these actually has more, I'll just quickly find it. There's one. So we can see there that we're actually bringing in uh, some extended details. You can see that the extended information has the word extended in there. And essentially what this means is it's going into the extended table. Uh, and this is a hardware server, so therefore this data is going into the CI type underscore server uh, area once promoted into the CMDB line. And you can see that the previous, uh, the current value in, is blank or zero for, the, for most. Uh, and we're going to be overwriting that with all this other data here. Okay, and you can see also ownership is changing with uh, with bringing this item in. So this gives you, uh, you know, the ability to, to make decisions. Uh, and the way that you would do that, I mean, obviously, if you, you could highlight everything and, and uh, import the selected items, or you could uh, uh, import the contents of this page. Uh, just bear in mind that we're, we're paging the information in this area, so you may need to click Next uh, in order to get to uh, the rest of the data. Uh, so Something else that you you would be uh, you'd also be able to do once you're processing this when uh, when you're processing this or in the middle of processing it, you might choose to uh, only bring in data items uh, in groups. So you may you may want to add these items to a selection. Uh, clicking that add to selections button then puts it into the results selections tab, and then you're able to process one of those items instead uh, of either you know being able to pick singular items or, or grouped items like that, you could just put them in uh, into the result and then start to look at those specifically on their own. You've also got the uh, tick box there that allows you to delete the record once it's been processed essentially. Uh, once you uh, click the import the item button, it, if you don't have that tick, it stays in the staging area, albeit with a, an import action of blank uh, and an import status of completed, I believe. Um, but uh, but it's it's good to tidy up, and it's much much better for you to uh, uh, to do that. If if you haven't, and you're you're left with a bunch of items that are listed but not going to be processed, then you've also got the ability to delete the completed records uh, in here. So <clears throat> I have processed uh, my data, and I've brought them in, and they're here. Okay. So in our diagram, we saw that there were. Uh, three SQL instances, and you can see that there, there are three SQL instances here, but I also alluded to the fact that I would probably choose to uh, create a logical item. I've, I've called that uh, uh, SEA log uh, for logical MS SQL cluster. So if I open that up as uh, some children, uh, a relationship to those three MS SQL instances. So what I'm going to do is from this point, from uh, in fact what I'll do is I'll start from the MS SQL instance uh, and start to look at what the relationships 
uh, screens show. So you can see here that it's got a relationship with a site, and it's also got, it's also got a parent relationship with the logical instance that we looked at a few seconds ago. So if I choose to go to view uh, and then choose the uh, child dependency, you can see that it has no dependencies, no, ch no child relationships. But if I choose to say parent, you should be able to see then there are uh, some other items that it's related to. You can see there, I'm struggling to make it move. You can see there that there are uh, some relationships there. But also, the relationships to this item is, are also displayed, and we'll look at that in a second anyway. So if I go back up to the logical uh, MS SQL uh, item and choose to show its child dependency, we'll slowly sort of uh, start to look at how the relationship has been, how the structure has been built. So I've created an item and related that item to those three uh, that we spoke about. So essentially what I can do, what I've done is I've created an operational relationship between these between the logical item and the three items. What that means is I, don't, I now don't have to create a relationship between these items and anything else. I only, you know, I, I only need to relate the logical item to uh, um, any other uh, server item service that, that is dependent on these th on the data that's within these three. Because these three are, aren't independent, they are, they're all sort of linked to, to um, in, in the format that would uh, allow high availability and redundancy to take place. It could be any one of these three things that would provide that better data. So if I then move over to uh, the next item in the, in the diagram that we saw, which was the reporting server, and I created a reporting server in there. So if I look at that now, and I open up the uh, child dependency there, you can start to see exactly the same diagram, except this time it's, it's, it's gone one level up, and you can see that the reporting server has an operational relationship with this MSSQL, logical MSSQL cluster, and then in turn that's related to those three items. And then we'll keep going. Uh, I think after that it was the marketing uh, application server, which is there. And if I choose that and, and go to display the graphics, it will show me again we have one level up again. So again, operational dependency going downwards. Uh, and the only thing that's really left to, to this, and then show you that the service can then be related to these items. So I have a, uh, a dashboard service again. Ignore the naming convention this and the amount of data that I've got. Uh, and I can choose also once I'm in here to show the child dependency, and you can see that there's nothing. Uh, I then go into the child area and choose to add a CI. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, so I then bring up the items, and the, the thing that I need to relate this to is the marketing application server. I choose that. It gives me the option to indicate uh, the type of relationship that there is. I'm just going to say that it uses and it is an operational uh, relationship and we now have that in place. So um, is, is that there are, you know, the relationship has then gone one level up. What I can do at this stage is now that I've also stated that this particular service can be monitored for availability by ticking this box, that tick then also makes this availability uh, tab available. Um, and then I can start to choose to create some event uh, handling uh, conditions. So I can state that I need to track the actions of the CMDB status on child items. What that means is if the child item status changes, then I want certain things to take place. I have one rule already created here and I've called it uh, the supporting server loss uh, and it's it's based around a type of child item status change so essentially what this says is if the related child status is set to faulty then everything within the standard actions should take place so within the standard actions what I've stated is that the status of this particular service should be set to offline uh, it should perform a diary update and you can see the diary update is in there uh, and it should also log a problem. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, decisions up to you whether it logs a problem or an incident or whatever. But in this instance, what it's what it's doing is it's going to log a problem. It's going to associate it uh, to this particular customer. No reason why it doesn't need to. Um, it's going to allocate it to this group and more importantly to this individual. Uh, it's going to it's going to have this particular uh, profile 
the summary is going to be set to that. The SLA and the priority that's going to be used is, is thus. Uh, the urgency and impact is going to be set to high, uh, and the condition is going to be uh, red. Okay, so that's typically what we're, we're saying that we're going to do. Equally, you could also choose to send the communication out to any number of people um, by setting these values here. Okay, so you can specify the mailbox, the template, whether you're sending it to a specific customer, a specific analyst, or, or some analyst, or a, an email address, should it be, uh, I don't know, maybe an, an external um, service provider that supports this particular item. Okay, so that's set up, so I will just quickly demonstrate that it actually does log uh, a call when the, the upper to faulty. So I just want to quickly come over here and show that we don't have any problems already logged. Uh, yep, okay, so let's just quickly go back over to the services area. I'll do it from from the services perspective rather than doing it from the uh, CI perspective because it allows us to stay where we are. I'll need to close it down and open it up again to refresh it. Sorry, this is already set to offline, so I'll just quickly set it to online. And set to available, it is. So if I now set that to faulty, uh, let me choose no, I don't want to change any details, and save that, that's still set to online, but if I open it up again, we should see that it's set to offline automatically. Uh, and then if we go to the associated requests, we should see that there is a problem logged. I'll just quickly go back to the service desk to show you that. There is a problem logged. So we have a 1287 problem logged, and it should, in fact, it does have all of the details that we specified it should have. Uh, it has the summary as we stated, and it should have the service already linked to the item. Okay, um, so hopefully that, that's demonstrated in basic form. There are various, I mean, this, this area can get quite complicated and there are uh, many other things that you can do with monitoring tools and, and, and catching uh, specific subjects within the, uh, the, the subject of an email in order to be able to then uh, affect or change the operational status of an item that then uh, obviously in turn then logs something that then gets assigned to somebody in order to perform an investigation. So there are, as I, as I stated in, in, the, in the first part of the, of the presentation, uh, CMDBs and what they are, what they typically have, I think I've demonstrated there that you know, you're able to store the information, much wider uh, um, need to have uh, a discussion around how we design our CMDB, uh, what data we bring in, uh, a much larger conversation around the uh, the, the considerations of, of what to store in there and considering that, that we might be going for a CMS approach in that support works doesn't necessarily hold the truth about a particular item that essentially holds what it needs in order to progress a particular request and all that kind of stuff. But also down to you know the, the various operational uh, relationships that can be set up between items uh, and then also acting on those items as the original description of what a CMDB uh, stated. Okay, so hopefully, um, I hope that's, uh, that's been at least interesting uh, and, uh, and have uh, at least inspired uh, some of you to, uh, uh, to delve a little deeper into the, the many things that I might have touched upon um, in this session today. Um, so really, that just, uh, that just leaves me to uh, go back to the presentation and uh, start to invite you to ask some questions. Thank you everyone for joining. Obviously, um, we will address a few questions. I appreciate we are just running over time slightly, um, so we will just take a few. Any that we don't manage to get through, we will take um, off up, up and, and continue to um, address them offline. But in the meantime, Samara, I've got them in front of me. I can certainly read a couple of them. Um, sure. Are, are the connectors standard with SupportWorks 7.6? 
the uh, okay so <clears throat> um, I, I don't know what, what what is meant by standard uh, there are connectors available uh, or, or I think the question might be saying then are they available as standard with 7.6 uh, in terms of an upgrade uh, certainly some connectors are delivered uh, as part of a brand new installation but that's something I don't think it's something that that, um, that we can answer straight away here it depends on um, you know when when your installation has taken place certainly connectors are available it's uh, I think it's just dependent uh, on a conversation that needs to take place with the care team Okay, thank you. And um, again, we'll make sure that the care team follow up with you um, on that one. Um, how is easy is it to remove configuration types or edit configuration types once CIs have been associated to them? Right. Okay. So that it, it is a little bit cumbersome. Um, the there are uh, I think part of the reason why that question is probably being asked is that if you try to delete a type, a configuration type, um, when the CIs are associated, it kind of prevents you. Um, and, uh, and and so it should because obviously removing that type or that configuration category will then leave that CI floating uh, and, and you won't be able to get to it. Uh, it becomes very difficult to find that item. So essentially what's required is to move those CIs into maybe a temporary type uh, and then delete that particular uh, category or type and then reassociate those CIs back to something that you want to uh, set it up to. So it's not it's not that difficult if you know how, but it, it is more of a, a database back-end thing if you don't want to uh, disassociate the CIs using the, uh, the SupportWorks client. Okay, on to the next one. Can you offer any guidance on defining parent-child relationships between different CIs and also viewing those relationships within the DCM tool? Specifically, an example such as if the server normally the parent of an application is the database, a child of the application, or the server, or both. All right. Okay. So <clears throat> the way the way that I looked at this was more about what is being provided to what. So if you have an uh, imagine uh, imagine that there's a, a tree, a uh, top level node with some items below. So if the items below are providing a, a particular service to the item above, then actually, although the relationship seems like the, the, the dependency is going upwards, actually the dependency is going down. So what I would do is look at the operational dependency. So if uh, in, the, in the diagram that we saw earlier on, I don't know if I'm able to quickly just slip back to, to that particular diagram uh, and just hit from current screen. Can everyone still see that? Anna, can you see that? Correct, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in this particular example, we were talking about these uh, MSSQL instances and them providing uh, uh, there being a, an operational relationship between them and this reporting server. So essentially, this reporting server should be the parent because you can then start to look at what it is being provided by these children. And I typically this is dependent on that, so it gives you the impression that these should be the parent, but actually it's the other way around. So you, I, I would start by looking at the operational dependency in order to decide whether something is a parent or a child. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, next one is, you mentioned the schema report, but also that there is more detailed information on the schema um, that's available. Where is um, this information held? Okay, so the the scheme. The, what, what I said was that there are there are many ways of getting uh, to the schema and, and and sort of delving deeper into the schema. The schema report will give you much more detail than any of the other tools will give you, but it won't it won't allow you. To, if you were a DBA, for instance, you might look at the schema report, but you'll probably want to go through and and, and actually have a look at the tools uh, that we deliver as part of the um, the installation and is found on the on the server. The schema report will contain all of the information that you're going to need about the tables. It just seems like there's, there's a lot in there. Um, but if you use uh, the database schema editor, that will also give you some information around the tables in the database. Uh, and also there's a, there's a section within the data dictionary. So if you were to go into the administration menu, edit current data dictionary, at the very top node is actually a database node. And that can expand to give you some details about that particular uh, table as well and the fields within it. Thank you. Um, next one, can sets of CIs be grouped together and the group name configuration type be associated with a particular call, e.g. a change management call? An example would be a name to define a set of servers but not with any operational relationship. 
Yeah, well, yes, but but you can't group CIs together. Um, what what you can do is is as, as I did in that uh, demonstration, is you can create something logical uh, that that would then uh, show uh, the grouping. For instance, the, uh, the, the you know the MSSQR databases or the database uh, nodes um, items that I showed on the diagram uh, were linked together by by a logical uh, uh, instance or item um, which has a, a relationship between with those three items. You can then relate that item to anything else that you wanted. So the the problem comes when if you're if you're relating the logical item in a change, and you're actually looking at what that change means, the detail of what you're going to be changing won't be held on that logical item. It will be held on each of those individual items that it's related to. So um, I, I don't know whether it will serve your purpose. It sounds like something that you might want to sort of explore a little bit further and understand what, what the purpose of doing that is. And I think if it's simply, uh, you know, in terms of associating an, an item or associating many items, if there are too many, then uh, I think you'll probably lose the detail if you do that. I think it's essential that if you're, especially on a change, that the items that are um, um, subject to that change are related to the change record rather than uh, some some sort of uh, uh, logical item. So I think what you're saying is, can I group them and then specify the group so that it automatically adds all of those items rather than individually go through and select those items? Um, and at the moment, I don't think SupportWorks is capable of doing that. Okay. I'm conscious of time, we'll just take a couple more. Do you have a way to automate the staging check for changes? Autom well, it, it already is automated. Uh, in, oh, in terms of uh, automatically, as soon as it's been uh, imported to do the determine import actions, I guess with customization that's possible. So um, rather than wait for uh, um, for anything to take place, I guess it could be it could be automated. It is a customization now. At the moment, the uh, the system is delivered with the ability for someone to select or press that button rather than it automatically as part of any import or as part of uh, um, uh, any process that takes place in the background for it to go and determine all of that. It is uh, a manual exercise, but customization, uh, uh, and further discussions with uh, a Hormel consultant, I guess that, that's, that's entirely possible. Okay, um, we are using Landsweeper to collect information. Can you link Landsweeper the way you said you can link into SCCM? Uh, you wouldn't. I don't. I don't. I believe, uh, and you'll you'll probably have to. Um, we'll probably have to send you some further details about uh, whether we have one or not. I don't think we have a Landsweeper connector, but it certainly would be able to bring data into SupportWorks in exactly the same way as you saw me do it in the uh, in the data import tool by via a query of some sort. We'd have to work that query out. Um, but I don't I don't think at this stage I don't think we have a land sweeper connector. Um, certainly I can I can feed that back to Anna and get that sent to you as a, as an official sort of a, um, statement. But certainly if if land sweeper has the data then there's no reason and and we understand fully what that data looks like and what structure it sits in. There's no reason why connectors couldn't be built for it. I mean it's not going to be tomorrow obviously if the demand came in then uh, then they, there could be a connector. Um, I don't think we have one at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, last two, um, how do you configure or change the ME relationship? There is no changing or configuring. The system manages all of that. So as and when a person is created within the tool or a department, a site, an organization, the system already manages the creation of that within the CMDB. You don't actually have to do anything. The system manages. You manage the main data in the company table or in the user table and it will automatically sort of create that entry in the CMDB. As I said before, it's not it's not there specifically to be the, uh, the, the truth about that particular item. The truth will either be held if it's held in support works, it will be held in the main table, or it will be held in your AD or your HR data, where in some of some of the other tools that you would use within your organisation. So you don't have an option to configure or change it. It just re it creates a reference to that item in the CMDB. Okay, thank you. And uh, final question online: With the VCM view, is there a way to save the view when you rearrange? Ah, interesting. I don't think there is. Um, certainly, that's something that could be uh, should be requested. 
um, you're right. It, it does take a bit of time. I guess you've you've had that frustration as well, where you've uh, you've moved it all into view into the right place, and then you've gone back in, and it's gone back to its squashed view. Certainly, something worth uh, communicating uh, and requesting um, uh, as a as a feature. Um, but it, I don't think there is a way of of saving it. I can okay. certainly ask and and send that to you as an official answer as well. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for everybody for staying on a little bit later, and thank you, Samurai, for taking us through CMDB. I hope everyone's found it useful. Um, if they have any additional questions, don't hesitate to contact me or your RM. Um, the recording will be made available, um, hopefully later today, and posted on the customer forum. Um, apologies for the audio interference. We will investigate that and hope it doesn't occur um, going forward. But thank you once again for your time, um, and we look forward to seeing you at future um, Hornbill Academy. Um, the next one is the 2nd of October, where we'll be exploring Hornbill dashboards. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Cheers, bye.